I'd like to call the January board meeting to order and please let the record show that all board members are present. And if you would, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do any members of the board have any modifications to the agenda? If not, we will accept the agenda as presented. President's report. I have a few things. First of all, I would like to recognize and welcome Troop 720, Boy Scout Troop here working on which badge? Communications. Communications. Awesome. And uh, we're glad you're here. And Hope you'll get something out of it and see how the process works. So, welcome from Springfield, Nixa, both. both, got them all. Well, <coughs> welcome to the board meeting. One of the things we always, I got a couple other things, but one of the things we do always is recognize our partners in education. Uh, those community businesses that are very much active in our schools and on a day-to-day -day basis and do just so many great things for our kids um, and our classes. So uh, before we recognize one specific business tonight, uh, I'd like to cover a few that uh, are partners with us, uh, those being Big Rock Climbing Gym, Champion Athletes of the Ozarks, Missouri Department of Transportation, PINMAC, Price Cutter Plus, and Ridgecrest Baptist Church. So we certainly thank them for all their contribution and uh, effort with our kids. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Josie McPhail to introduce our sort of spotlight partnership tonight, if she would. Good evening. Tonight's Partners in Education presentation will be presented to us by High Street Baptist Church. They started their partnership with us about six years ago, and it has strongly increased since. Currently, the church mainly serves students and staff at Weller Elementary, but recently has taken on projects at both Pipkin and Hickory Hills. High Street is very involved with Weller's Pride store through donations and volunteer work. To assist in helping students wrap the gifts they have purchased at the store and to celebrate the holidays, a large event is put on by the church, hosting over 600 people each December. Around 30 individuals from High Street participate as lunch buddies, and during map testing, snacks are provided for students in need. Also, every other week, power packs for every single student at Weller are provided by the church. These are just a few ways that this, this church humbly serves our students and staff. And to tell us a little bit more about that partnership, I'd like to introduce to you Tom Demers. Good evening, my name is Tom Demers. And as Josie said, I'm uh, with High Street Baptist Church. I'm actually associate pastor there. And our partnership began because our senior pastor's son at one point went to Weller Elementary. And he saw the need for us to be involved with that school and began praying about what we could do. And so over the course of the years, we've, we've done a number of things, but we started off in 2006 doing power packs. That happened because my wife saw something on television talking about how kids, when they haven't had enough to eat on the weekend, don't do very well in school the following week. So we began that year doing once a month for 110 kids. And the way we do it is every child gets a piece of paper and anyone who returns that form signed, we will give them food. And that is now bumped up over the last five years to 180 kids twice a month. And we do that quite a bit. We have a lot of volunteers. We pay for that out of the pockets of people who are part of High Street who give specifically to fund that. It's not a part of our general budget. So the money that is paid out is all from people who are donating and everything is volunteered so it's it's self-sustaining as a, a ministry we also do a number of other things as Josie mentioned and I'm just going to talk to you about each of them just a little bit and if you have questions I would be happy to answer them and I also have papers that talk about that after that I can give you <clears throat> last year one of the wives of a volunteer who helps helps with power packs came to the volunteer dinner 
that they do at Weller. They host a volunteer dinner. It's great. We love being able to be a part of that. And she said, well, I don't serve. I said, that's okay. Come. Your husband does. You can be there. It'll be great. We would love to have you be a guest. I said, I know Mrs. Monroe won't mind. So she came, and she found out that she was really good friends with the lady who manages the Weller store. And she got a burden to provide shoes for all of the kids at Weller. And so over the course of the summer, she began planning how she could make this happen. And if you don't know, I'm sure most of you do know, your Board of Education, there's 330 kids at Weller. And she came to me and said, can we make this happen? And I said, you know, I think we should give it a shot. And she specifically wanted to put Converse Chucks on these kids' feet. <coughs> they're, not ex they're, they're not cheap shoes, they're expensive. So she partnered with, as you can see here, Shoe Carnival. She got a good price for them, and we figured out it was going to cost about $8,500. And so she wanted to do more than just High Street, but in the attempt to raise the money, we began at High Street, and in four weeks, we raised all the money. And she was shocked. We were shocked. And so her next goal is to raise enough money so that every single elementary Title I school child can have a pair of shoes. And that is our goal this year. That's 5,700 children. <laughs> it's a lot of money, but we believe we can do it. And I'll, I'll talk about one of the ways we want to focus on doing that later. This year, we also begin doing lunch buddies. And I have down 20, but I, I was corrected. It's actually about 30 people who go and once a week sit and have lunch with these kids. And I actually have a report from one of the lunch buddies that his child has increased his reading score by 230 points. He's not reading with him, he's just eating lunch with him, but things are getting better. So we're seeing a, a good thing happen there and we're very appreciative to be a part of mentoring those kids. Something else we do is a, a Weller Christmas party and we have inflatables and blow ups and Santa and pictures and it's all free. They can come and do everything for free and the parents are just <coughs> shocked. And I can have a picture of my kid with Santa and it doesn't cost anything? Yes, we do that and it's a lot of fun. We hosted a basketball camp last year and had fourth through sixth graders come and they had a good time, got to meet some of the parents and give the kids some new skills. Some kids who did well and loved basketball were amazing and others got to just have some fun. Another area that we did outside of Weller, we, had a, we got a phone call from somebody who's a part of Pipkin and junior high, the basketball team there, wanted to have a nice shirt and tie for their kids which is not easy to do. Certain schools struggle with that kind of thing. So we put it out to the church community that we would like to do this. And we said, would you give $20 so that one child can have a shirt and tie? Well, they gave and gave and gave. And we actually bought enough shirts and ties so that every team, both teams of boys, could have two shirts and a tie. And they had money left over. They set up an account so that they can take care of a couple of other teams like the girls volleyball team and they have more money coming in because they heard about what we were doing. So it's been neat to see how one church giving just a little bit has caused others to become more generous and we're very grateful to be a part of that. This past year I believe you all instituted an emergency plan and we are actually partnered with Weller so that if there's a disruption in service and their building is unavailable they will actually come to our building and I have the paperwork on my desk to make that an official deal. So we're, we're doing that as well. I'd like to close with this. Um, High Street is celebrating our 75th anniversary this year and it's going to be a big deal. You'll probably hear about it in the community because we're pushing a lot of things to happen. But the biggest way that we are wanting to celebrate our 75th anniversary is to put shoes on the feet of 5,700 kids. So we're going to host a 5K run, walk, and you will hear a lot about us pushing to do that through one sole purpose. So I invite you to be a part of that. If you are able to run and you like running, then join us. If you can't and you say, I just want to pay for a pair of shoes, it's $25. And you can do either one through our website, which is highstreet.org. That is my presentation. If you have any questions, I would love to field them. Fantastic. Anybody got any questions? I just have a comment. I just, once again, I'm, I'm whoop. sorry. 
once again, I'm, I'm um, amazed at the partnerships that we have with with so many so many agencies and churches in the in the community, and and I, I'm very grateful that we're bringing these certain these people up here to, to tell us what they do with our schools and and to thank you for for what you do. One of the things that I was very uh, appreciative of is is the attitude that your church seems to have taken, which is we've done this now but look what we can do next and seeing that need and addressing that need but also kind of saying challenging your church community to do more because as we all know you know we don't get the best results we do unless the community is fully involved with our with our schools and and, and with our kids so so i want to thank you and i want you to continue to you know expand because because that's where it all you know that's where it all uh, happens when you do that so thank you thank you for being here tonight it's that time of the year that we are getting ready to be in the midst of school board elections and uh, one thing I just wanted I know we have several candidates or that are in the room tonight um, I'm gonna make a plug here <laughs> from an MSBA Missouri School Board Association standpoint if you'll go to their website if you're wanting to get information about serving on a school board please go to their website um, they have a one a great video on there this title serving on a school board a guide for school board candidates and it goes through many many of the issues that are we're dealing with in the state of Missouri from the school board standpoint it's a very good educational so I would encourage you as you're preparing uh, have this discussion it's a great opportunity to get up to speed on some of those uh, the website is www.msbanet.org if some of you haven't already been there um, <clears throat> there's tons of inf free information on there about being school board member and I would just encourage anybody that's a candidate to go there and and uh, get a lot of information. So that's my plug for MSBA. Uh, right now. Last time I mentioned that I would come back with a report to this board about, and I think I'll do it now, uh, the meeting that we had with, uh, Dr. Ritter and I had with the other, basically two urban districts in the state, St. Louis and Kansas City, that we met last week, or last uh, couple weeks ago. And uh, in fact, we have another meeting next week that we just found out about today um, but it was a meeting with the superintendent and the board president from st. Louis and the superintendent and board president from Kansas City and um, we kind of put it together hoping that we would <coughs> just to be honest with you to see how it would work and see if we would get any dialogue and four and a half hours later <laughs> after significant amount of discussion of common issues that we as urban schools have um, basically agreed to continue to meet and found significant number of common themes uh, common issues that we're dealing with um, preschool uh, really key issue on a lot of things dealing with neighborhoods and neighborhood schools and trying to develop neighborhoods so that in the school being the focal point of these these neighborhoods uh, and a lot of those kind of things charter schools obviously um, a lot of agreement on charter schools with respect to you know if you're going to have charter schools they ought to be owned by the, the public dis the public school system and ought to be governed so that accountability is the same I mean we have a lot of agreement on there uh, a lot of discussion about teacher tenure laws that that was brought up don't know what's gonna happen with that but I know that's some issues in the legislature but the one thing we did I think and dr. Ritter might want to add to it was we came up with enough well let me back up Senator Pierce who is the education chair uh, for the <coughs> Senate uh, came and spoke to us and there was a significant what I would consider a significant amount of surprise on his face that Springfield Kansas City and st. Louis were at the same table talking about issues that hasn't happened in the past there hasn't been dialogue between the th three districts um, at all in fact we're to a point where we're, we're talking about working on legislative issues together 
um, with the state legislature on issues that are common to us and consistent with MSBA's policies and uh, positions on on uh, on issues. So uh, I keep hearing around Jeff City that when the three of us come arm in arm talking to legislatures, that there's going to be some mouth drop because we're there, three largest schools in the in the state are together on the same page on a lot of these issues. So um, I thought it was a, a really, really beneficial meeting. Um, <coughs> Senator Pierce did talk to us about what his ideas and thoughts were, and we certainly expressed our ideas to, to him uh, concerning local control um, and issues like that that everybody pretty much agreed to that that was probably the biggest focus was leave us alone and let us do what we need to do uh, as a district uh, because good things are happening in the districts. St. Louis and Kansas, there's a lot of great things going on in Kansas City and St. Louis, regardless of what you hear or read or whatever. Um, and truly the legislators don't know that. So one of the things MSBA is doing is scheduling some tours for legislators to go to the urban districts to tour their facilities and find out and see firsthand what's happening in their district. Um, not that they don't have problems, but there's issues. There's a lot of great things going on uh, that's out there. But uh, Senator Pierce wasn't really encouraging <laughs> about budget and about uh, things that are going on and the issues that were out there. Um, basically, his bottom line was if it's not in a formula, it's probably at risk. So a lot of the categoricals are transportation, early childhood, things like that. This categorical is not looking good. And so, who knows? Uh, the one thing he did want was to try to get uh, some of the decisions made as early in the session as possible so that we don't wait till May 6th to get them, which is probably wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but so that districts can make decisions with respect to teacher contracts and salaries, get whatever the case may be to get it done early. But. Uh, they're going to try, but I'm not sure that they'll be able to accomplish that. But uh, uh, it was a good meeting, and I'll try to keep you all informed as, as we have more discussions about it. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Dr. Ritter, uh, with the discussion. Uh, in fact, I think St. Louis is even wanting to come down here to look at our assessment uh, program. So yeah, maybe uh, the first time they've ever been here. <laughs> yeah, we really had a last half hour was really on achievement. And uh, they were excited about what we were doing as far as our review of data, data at the classroom and things like that. So they want to come down. And I think they're communicating with uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, yes. And uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Ms. Callum. I think it's important for our local legislators to know that these kind of discussions are happening. And I think, you know, maybe a letter to each of them saying that it happened because I think so often um, educational issues become partisan kinds of discussions when really I think those of us who have sat at this table long enough know that um, it's really usually a bipartisan solution that's the best solution and I think if our local legislators knew that there were some common um, goals educationally that you know might be able to be bridged with a bipartisan approach you know I think it's worth a shot so you know maybe even a letter to them just letting them know that this happened um, and that these discussions are going to be ongoing but um, you know I really think so often the the line is drawn in the sand and neither side will go over it and then nothing really gets accomplished one of the things that we talked about with Senator Pierce which I thought was very appropriate and it, it's time is <clears throat> We need to get out of this just say no syndrome. And in the past, typically, a lot of the discussions when it came up with whether it's charter school, open enrollment, whatever it might be, basically the, edu the education institution was just say no. And now it's to the point of we don't like it and we don't think this is the way to go. Here's some alternatives and provide alternatives instead of just digging your, drawing the line in the sand, as you said, and digging our heels in. They're looking for solutions as much as we are. And so uh, hopefully that will open up some dialogue between uh, the legislatures and at least the urban districts about some of those issues. Uh, but we need to come not 
necessarily complaining and whining or saying no, but here's what are you trying to accomplish and what can we do uh, to do it uh, and bring some solutions or alternatives to them. So, well, and, uh, and but also conversely, the the oftentimes the attitude from the legislator legislature has been no, you know, or you know, I mean, it, it goes two ways, and I think um, being open to finding. <coughs> Other ways to to solve some of these issues from a from a legislative funding perspective is is key, and I think that's where the cloud of legislators, you know, in those in in those three areas of the state, which are you know really a nice triangle, yeah. could go a long way. Well, and, and it's interesting, <coughs> Dr. Rick, to support this. I I specifically asked the question of were they considering the other side of the equation as opposed to just cutting everything. And basically, the answer was no. Uh, they weren't really interested in talking about it, and so, uh, which was kind of disheartening in the fact that they, they they ruled it out as an option before they ever had a chance to talk about it. So, we'll see how it goes. But uh, I think the meetings are very productive and worthwhile, and we'll continue them, and uh, particularly during the legislative session, and and share the good things from each district and and what we can do. So, that was worth the time and effort. Any other questions or we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Reeder. One of the key things that uh, came out of our meeting there, Jerry and Mr. Lee, was uh, with Kansas City St. Louis. <coughs> Kansas City was going through a lot of struggle and strife because of all the uh, downsides that were closing the schools. And a lot of people on the outside were just really bashing them. And so they challenged them to get into their schools, and that changed things overnight. And I really think, as, as we look at urban environments, that is the biggest struggle, because as soon as uh, you hear poverty, you hear all these different things, and all of a sudden, uh, schools become victims, and I really, uh, and the kids become victims, and I really encourage our community to get into our schools. Uh, I had the opportunity to finally finish all visiting all schools last week, and very impressed with what's going on in our schools. And uh, without exception, in fact, a uh, fifth grade teacher at uh, Hickory Hills <coughs> just uh, she was really not excited about the smart board. Has a smart board in there now. I don't know if I want to retire, but my husband says you will. So, <laughs> but anyway, it's it's kind of interesting uh, how uh, I think getting into those classrooms, getting into those schools, is really says a lot, says an awful lot. On that note, uh, I want to uh, thank Mark Fisher and his staff for an outstanding job as far as the uh, Tournament of Champions. Great crowds, uh, great competition again. Uh, uh, some really outstanding games. Uh, and so I think it's become really a January event uh, for the, uh, not just Springfield, but uh, for Southwest, if not the Midwest, as far as uh, an event to, to go to. So I don't know if Mark's here. I don't think I saw him, so he missed the opportunity. I'll teach him about coming to a board meeting. But anyway. Uh, Nick's is playing Kickapoo right now. I, oh, that's right. That's right. Ooh, that'd be a one to go to. Anyway. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, our next week is, uh, the week to celebrate uh, <coughs> school board members and volunteers. And so Governor Jay Nixon has proclaimed the week, and that's January 23rd through the 29th, as School Board Recognition Week. And so on that note, we have as many as 3,600 people sitting on boards in the state of Missouri. That's an awful lot of people. And, uh, and as you think about political entities, uh, um, they probably have more to say about the future uh, of uh, this state as well as the future of America because of their focus on kids. And one thing I'm going to say about our school board is that there's no question each of you are focused on kids, especially the kids here in Springfield. And I think also to the greater uh, effect of impacting uh, the kids of Missouri. I even think to the point of where uh, you get excited, and I'm thinking of Mr. Hosmer here, of actually reading a book <laughs> on research by Haiti, which really is very, very good if you have the patience and time to do so. 
but each and every one of you. Uh, I didn't understand half of it, so <laughs> there's a caveat to that. Well, anyway, you, uh, anyway, I appreciate you doing that, but really across the board, all of you uh, are really very committed. And so what I'd like to do is read the proclamation from the governor. Whereas a system of quality public education is essential to the future of our state and nation, and whereas the people of Missouri have a long tradition of support for public education in their local school districts, and whereas local school boards are the ultimate expression of the unique American institution of representative governance of public school districts, and whereas local school boards acting on behalf of and in close connection with the people of their communities chart the direction of education in their communities, <coughs> and whereas local school boards serve as the key community advocate for children, youth, and public schools. Now, therefore, I, Jeremiah W. J. Nixon, Governor of the State of Missouri, do hereby proclaim January 23rd through the 29th, 2011, to be School Board Recognition Week. So I want to thank all of you and congratulate you. And, and uh, I know that you really enjoy every minute of your, of your volunteer time. So um, on that note, if uh, Steve, if you could help hand these out to the board members. He's a numbers Here. guy. <clears throat> See, we do have name tags out here. <laughs> <laughs> I especially want to thank at this time, and I know we're going to have an opportunity to thank this person uh, again in April, but I want to thank Dr. Homan uh, for his years. And of course, he is uh, uh, looking forward, not looking back at all, but uh, I do want to thank him for his commitment to, to his children as well as the children of Springfield Public Schools. Thank you very much. Your leadership is just dynamite, and so I uh, appreciate it. At this time, I'm going to take time now to explain uh, to the board, um, and uh, feel free to ask questions at the end of the presentation, because I have a feeling some of your questions are going to be answered as we go through. So if you could just kind of jot down any kind of questions that you have uh, as we go through, that'd be appreciated. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mark Manis and his uh, staff for helping me put this, put this together. <coughs> My understanding is that Pam Bodine was really the one in charge of the art that you're going to see, so uh, that's going to be special. And uh, anyway, um, I also want to just kind of set the stage here a little bit. You do understand that we're a high-performing system. We are a quality system. We are meeting all of the criteria that is necessary for a quality system, including the seven categories uh, of quality. And really, uh, the, the staffing that we have in central office, as well as the staffing at the sites, uh, is really best match that we have uh, for our current student uh, population as well as uh, our economic environment. The key component to, to our uh, current staffing at central office is really focused on operations, which really uh, helps manage and provide uh, support for the, the sites and uh, for the administration as well as the teachers at the sites and, and also really uh, provides accountability for them. And then we have the, the business service, which is really supporting the sites and supporting operations, as well as uh, the, uh, the business services and then the, the staff development research piece. And what's interesting over the years since I've been here, there's been a little shift of accountability moving more towards a research data driven type of decision making. And really, it's really getting down to where it's happening and the classroom. In fact, you can walk into a lot of our schools for all of our schools, elementary, middle, and high, and you're gonna find that there's collaboration going on and the teachers and the students actually have that data in front of them, and it's always right up to date data. And so there's decision making that's occurring, quality decision making that's occurring, and it's always looking for ways, PDSA, constantly looking for ways to get better. And so that's why uh, the current system that we have uh, really supports that. Now, I feel we're gonna have to make an adjustment because of our revenue. 
And the, the best thing that we can do in any kind of quality system is to protect our customer and protect the customer as close as possible to the classroom as possible. What I'm getting at there is, is that we're going to work as, on a temporary basis, okay, to be able to say, hey, so, uh, the teacher in the classroom is very, very good. The site leadership is very, very good. We're here to support that. We're here to help provide vision for that. We're here to provide innovation for that. But we won't be able to be as involved with it as much as we have in the past. And then also the same thing is, is going to be true that we're going to be really uh, our involvement in the community. We are a community school system. And the community, as you heard with High Street Baptist Church tonight, is really a main reason why our kids do so well. Our kids get support from not just the churches, but from overall community, Northside Betterment. I could go on and on and on as far as different types of support that we get from the community. And so you're going to see us not separating intentionally, but we won't have the time or the energy to be able to be working with the community as much as we have before. And, and so I really anticipate that this is something that's going to stretch us a little bit. But I think we can get by for about a year or two. And then eventually we'll have to respond and continue to respond as our system grows and matures. And we see that the needs are going to continue to, I would say, uh, be more trying. This year alone, we're anticipating a major jump in our poverty rate. And in seeing that major jump in that poverty rate, we're going to see that basically the data, the engagement in the classroom is going to be so critical, so critical to keep the child wanting to come to school. And, I, and we have that going in many of our title schools. And that's an exciting thing. And so I do present to you cuts we're going to make. Um, I'm re recommending, and this is early in the process, but I'm, make, I'm making these recommendations now at this time. And ultimately, though, I can see an adjustment, and, and Mr. Renner and I've had this conversation several times, of as the system allows and there's flexibility within the system, we, be, we will make adjustments as we go, okay, as far as the overall structure of the system. But I failed. To, a need to announce now so that we can kind of get out in front of it and, let, and make sure that we uh, understand that these cuts are going to happen and then eventually we're going to be flexible around those cuts and uh, ultimately I and tonight I'll give you some assurances that we will stay tight to a commitment of a certain dollar amount I don't want to say that yet anyway on that note then Over the, this is our fourth year where we're seeing an adjustment in budget because of revenue shortfalls. And so going, I mean, going into next year, I'm talking about, that's our fourth year in a row. And we've worked extremely hard to keep it away from the classroom. We've had some classroom cuts last year. We've been able to support some of those classroom cuts because of the uh, stimulus money. This year, going into next year, uh, the classroom may, may be uh, impacted, but hopefully not as bad, and it won't be as bad because of the cuts we're going to make here. We are going to be maintaining strategic priorities. The strategic priorities were very, very clear, okay, this, as far as class size is concerned, and as well as uh, uh, competitive teachers' compensation. We're going to be really working those two. Now, Mr. Manus will be looking at another revisit of the strategic plan. Um, in the very over the next year and uh, but right now that's our primary focus we're also looking at this as a uh, uh, focusing in more primarily on retirements and um, I kind of like that it kind of takes the but anyway uh, we are going to be focusing on retirements and then seeing what we can do to work around that that's why it's an ongoing conversation okay one thing I want to mention that uh, we've always, in a quality system, we're always responding to feedback from our staff, from our customers, and from our community. And that's what we're doing. We basically had focus groups. Mr. Maynard had focus groups in early uh, November and with teachers, with parents, <coughs> with senior citizens, with people from the community. And uh, these cuts are in part coming from that feedback.
Springfield Public Schools is a high-performing district. Um, we're still waiting for the distinction award, but anyway, uh, the high-performing system, and we constantly are continually getting better in, in spite of the fact that uh, we are becoming a poorer district, more urban-like. And we are also very lean administratively. Uh, when we compare apples to apples, as far as Desi, Desi's comparisons are concerned, and we're talking about schools our size and even smaller, uh, we're very lean administratively. Our focus is academic excellence, we have high uh, customer satisfaction. We want to keep that. Those are our objectives. So restructuring and cost cutting are emergency measures uh, to address budget short shortfalls. But I really think that's the key thing here is to understand that this is an economic move, not necessarily a systems move focused on achievement, focused on persistence to graduation, focused on customer satisfaction. So it's, it's a real tight line that we're walking there by looking at the economic picture and pulling back. The long-term reduction of administrative uh, support is not advised. It may look different in the future. It may be something that, and of course, as technology gets more into the picture and as the needs of our children change, we, need, well, we will need to respond differently in the future. Continued discussions and monitoring of operations with site departmental leadership will be essential uh, following the cuts. In other words, we're going to continue to see how these cuts are impacting our sites and making adjustments to be able to respond to the needs at the sites. The key factor there is the accountability for performance that's going to be expected for each classroom, for each child and each teacher. and how how much can we over serve to oversee, oversee that and expect it? So we're talking about 15 administrative positions. We're talking about $1 million minimum. I guarantee you, guarantee the community, guarantee our staff that we will have a million dollar reduction cost in staffing in central office. A million dollars is an equivalent of up to 20 teaching positions. You will see that we're really talking about just over 21 teaching <coughs> positions as, you, as we go through these cuts. Please understand that that doesn't mean we won't cut. We won't cut. Uh, classroom teachers. It just says we won't have to cut an additional 20, 21. Okay. Continuous classroom improvement facilitators, three. Deputy Superintendent of Operations, Assistant Director of Facilities, Director of Leadership Development, Community Relations will have two FTE, Manager of Human Resources, Coordinator of Attendance, Assistant Director of Transportation, Senior Project Manager, Administrative Assistant Middle Schools, Associate Superintendent, Title I Special Ed, and Board Secretary. It gives you a total of $1,081,247. Now these are places and positions that are being cut. As we move to July 1 or June 30, and when the budget's approved, we may see some adjustments, but I guarantee you we'll have a reduction of a million dollars. Here's some examples of impact of these, these cuts that we have right now that, that I'm proposing. We will see a pullback from support for CCR, continuous uh, classroom improvement, feeder system, uh, alignment and persistence to graduation. In other words, the constant persistence to graduation, the focus and the alignment between kindergarten all the way through a graduation. <clears throat> Another thing, in uh, educational services, district supported professional learning opportunities, uh, especially uh, in the step up program, uh, we're stepping back from that. As far as community relations, support for volunteer and partner programs, those responsibilities will be moving more and more to the site. 
As far as finance and uh, business operations, we're talking about field supervision, primarily in the transportation, food service, custodial maintenance. And then in human resources, we're talking about supervision of collective bargaining and benefits. And the list really does go on in each of these areas, but these are just one thing that we wanted to highlight in each of the areas that we're cutting. In coming weeks, we will, as I mentioned, we will be more, there will be more specifics of impact on departments and sites. And we'll be drawing that out as we think through the process. Because remember, we're gonna stay with current staffing until the end of the school year, until really June 30th. See, so the realization of that impact needs to be part of a conversation, a lot of collaboration. And we already had a lot of that. It's just gonna get, we're gonna need to do more and more and, and anticipate how it's gonna impact it. And then also cabinet structure. I have ideas about cabinet structure, um, but we still are gonna need to see how that all rolls out as uh, we move through the needs and, and look at the needs of overall structure. And then we, in this whole process, we are definitely gonna have a reassignment of duties and or adding to people's list of duties. Here are some things that we talked about, you might remember back in July. Some of these things came forward and some of these things were pushed by the wayside. You might remember the uh, seven period day was pushed by the wayside. The, uh, um, the transportation piece, as far as the distance from the home, we, we didn't see that much savings, so we pushed that by the wayside. These are some of the areas we're still looking at and we'll come to you with, and you're gonna need to show support by voting to support. The first one will be in, in February. We're gonna discuss with you changes in the 2011-2012 cal school calendar where we'll see at least a half million dollar savings. But also, I think this is, a, this is kind of a, uh, a, an opportunity for us to grow as well because I do see what we're gonna be doing with this calendar, giving teachers opportunities to really look at the data and make immediate decisions and changes in their classroom as opposed to waiting for the quarter or waiting for the end of the year or making it a yearly or a bi-year type of thing. The three-tier start times, we're, we're serious about that. There's some nice savings there. Um, during these times of recession, during these times of economic struggles, um, we feel this is the time to do that and um, we will come back to the board with that. We don't have a time uh, when we'll come back for that. And then of course, the overall substantial cuts to the 2011-2012 overall budget. We will come back to you as we continue the budget discussions with more cuts that are happening within uh, the budget. For instance, an example would be textbook adoption. That's just one of many that we'll come back to you with as far as uh, possibilities and budget cuts. So this is really the first thing, is the cuts to the uh, center office so that everybody gets a feel for uh, what's that gonna look, what that's gonna look like. Okay, that's pretty much the picture that, uh, that you have in front of you. Um, the, um, I guess the place that I'd like to have right now is just really any kind of a question or a discussion that you'd like to have. Or, uh, floor is open, let's go it that way. Question for Dr. River. I'll, um, I'll start. I'm sure I may have some more, but, uh, you know, as you talked about this, you talked about some things not being able to be done that we do now and push down to the building level. And my concern there is every, every building I've gone into this year, the principal's not been in their office. Right. Which is good. Which is good. They're out in the class. How can we push more things on their plate when they're already, that's my question to you, is how are we going to push more things down to them without some of the support they've been getting when they're already out doing things now? I mean, they're not sitting in their office waiting to greet a board member. They're out uh, working with teachers and working with kids, um, and yet when parents come in, others come in, they want them to be there. You know, I, I'm, I'm concerned about that, that as we pull resources away from them and we push more to that level, when are principals and teachers going to find time to do these things that somebody else has been doing? I know you don't have 
all those answers yet, but that's part of it. We're looking into that, yes. And um, the things that we've worked on, I think as Mrs. Kissinger told me one time, we see each other, it seems like a lot of times, places she talked to me about a mobility rate that's gone much higher, you know, as we looked at our students and as, as they've, um, not just our students, but students coming in and leaving our district, that we've had a much higher mobility rate. And I know our technology helps us some with that if they're within our system, but it still creates issues when we have as many um, students leaving and coming because you still have to acclimate them to the new classroom, find out, you know, how they're learning, what they're doing that as that rate goes higher, we're pulling away from some things that we've done in increasing our attendance and increasing our graduation rate, which are good things. And without that support, I, I mean, I understand what's driving this, but at the same time, um, sometime between now and June 30th, I'd like some specifics on exactly how are we going to take care of the details. Right. Because the big picture is, well, we'll just do away, we're going to do away with 15 positions. Some things people will do they're not doing. Some things will go left undone. And so the things left undone, is that going to prevent us from solving some of the issues that we've started working on? And so I, I think for me, um, um, this is the first go round, and I know that hasn't all been decided. But by July 1st, I'd like to know how, <coughs> what are the details, and who's going to do it, or are we not going to do it anymore? That's Which is be. okay too. I mean, if there's some things we just can't do anymore, then we just need to make sure people understand we can't do them anymore. Yeah, it doesn't it. matter if they're good or not, it's just they can't be done. So uh, I think that's, um, this is a starting point, but by that June 30th, we should <coughs> know those things because that's when the new school year starts. Yeah, we'll be doing less for with less. That's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of that going on. Okay, any others? Yeah. I think a, a couple things. Um, I came on the board um, in the in the early 2000s when um, the community was just starting to feel and recognize the impact that decisions that previous boards had made in the 90s, um, specifically in regards to um, building maintenance and. Um, and funding of um, and improvements of our facilities were really uh, postponed for a variety of reasons. And um, I think I realized then that um, oftentimes decisions that are made now, we may, I mean, I, I definitely think we're gonna see some impact, but the impact won't be felt for, you know, four or five or six or seven <coughs> more years. Um, especially when we've, I think, done an excellent job of trying to align our system to where we follow a student from the time that they're in kindergarten until the time they graduate and really identify um, where those risk factors are for those, for those children. So I think it's really important to emphasize, and I heard you say these words a couple times, and I think that they bear repeating. This is a temporary solution to an economically driven um, uh, situation, and it really is an emergency. Uh, and so I think that, that those are important um, <coughs> messages for our community to hear, that this is not a solution that's been come up, that has been developed because we think this is what's best for our system. And um, I'm not sure we can say that enough. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I think the other thing that, um, you know, each of us has witnessed or been involved in or had some sort of connection to some of these individuals or, or, or um, positions and what they have done for our, for our system. And I uh, specifically like to speak to um, 
several years ago, we identified the real need to um, support new teachers. That we saw that people were leaving our system in the first few years, and that wasn't only bad for them individually, but it was also um, a real burden on us financially and, and in terms of human resources. And so we invested a, you know, I think came up with a, a, a really wonderful um, program in terms of, of step up. Um, received state and national recognition for what that program did. Um, and, you know, it not only kept people, it not only kept teachers, uh, supported them and, and helped them grow in those early years, but it really did what I think we've been <coughs> criticized in education for not doing, but it coached some people out of the profession before they got <laughs> too deeply entrenched in into um, the system, and that really wasn't the best fit for them professionally. So, um, you know, I'm concerned about I'm concerned about those costs and what that's going to mean um, in terms of our staff development. Um, and I guess just in general, you know, I've heard you know a lot of talk tonight about urban school districts and poverty, and you know, I think the one thing that I really have come to appreciate about Springfield is we can't be identified by just one phrase like that. I mean, if you look at some of our schools, they are more suburban than either than even some of our neighbors. It, you know, if you look at free and reduced lunch rate, you know, um, and we have some very rural schools. And so I guess I would just caution us to not define ourselves by that term because I think it's really important. I think it's we're uniquely positioned probably any district in the, in the state to really offer a wide variety of educational services to a wide variety of families and students and I think that that's really our um, our strength and you know the growth in um, the poverty rate is not unique to Springfield I mean it's it's um, it's what's going on in all the districts around us as the economic impact um, hits families and hits working families and hits <coughs> middle class families. So, um, yeah, I guess I would, I've just always been cautious for us to be careful of how we define ourselves because I think um, we're really, we're really a hybrid that, um, and, I, and I think we've been able to provide quality education for a real variety of, of students and um, you know I'm concerned about how these impact how these cuts are going to impact our ability to do that okay Dr. Breder. well uh, um, thank you for, for this I know that we as a board have pushed you to look at everything across the system to look at, at where we can can scoot through this economic crisis without uh, without really affecting the classroom I, I agree with you I don't think and, and the other board members I don't think these cuts are sustainable without affecting the classroom and I think I have to agree with with both of my colleagues that that um, this is likely we hope to be a temporary measure I think we have to challenge you and staff to continue to follow the data and give us feedback because if we start to see things like graduation rates slipping and and our, our end of year performance numbers slipping, uh, then we have to see why and see where we need to, to fill in the gaps because uh, we've seen so much improvement over the past three or four years that uh, I, I don't want to see us moving from a, an, a district of innovation to a district of compliance. I think our patrons deserve more than that and I think we all expect more of ourselves than that. So, so I, would, I would just encourage you now to keep us in the loop with the data and where you see where you see needs emerging that we may not have um, have seen and and let's watch our results because uh, uh, this is a good time to innovate um, and be creative and let's not take a step backwards while we're doing it and I think our patrons need to know that I think our our, our district taxpayers need to know that yes we're watching out wisely for their dollars but um, at some point, we're probably not going to be able to provide the service that, that they expect of us. Comments? Mr. Osmond. <clears throat> I'd like to follow up on a couple of things that have been said already. One is, uh, I think Mr. Renner makes a good point, and, and that is that 
that I would like to see before we uh, vote on this or approve this, what uh, job duties these positions had, and you know, maybe we can do it visually, put them in a box, and where's that job duty going? And, and if you're putting it over onto somebody else who's got a full plate of job duties, what are you taking away from that person? Because if you assume that everybody's working hard in administration right now, and they got a full plate, then you can't just say, I'm going to add four things to your plate and expect you to do it. Or either they're not working very hard and they didn't have a full plate, or, or they're just going to not do three or four other things that you told them to do last year. So, uh, and, and I think it's, it's just not uh, realistic to expect that you can add additional duties onto somebody that's working full time already. Well, I've seen an education happen over and over again. Over, over 40 years, 38 years. Right. Without right. question. What happens is you do less of everything and you just kind of touch it as well, opposed to being it, thorough, and, thorough. And I guess what I would like to see uh, to that, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm being a little facetious because you do that. Every business does that. But, yes. but there's got to be some, there's got to be either some, um, something we're not going to focus on as much or we're going to ask those people not to focus on as much or not to do, to take away so that they can take on those extra burdens and, and as a board member I'd like to see that uh, I'd like to see how you know you're going to split up the functions of the deputy superintendent of operations who's going to do all those added duties um, and um, um, you know how they're going to do that with their full schedule and if and if some of those things are going to be taken away um, you know what are those things because that's where the real rubber hits the road I mean you can say we're going to move all your duties to somebody else and They'll do it, and everybody thinks, well, it's solved. You know, problem solved. you got one person doing two jobs. You save $100,000 and everything's hunky-dory when we all know it's not. Uh, so I, I would certainly uh, uh, like to see that going forward. Uh, I'd also like to see, I, I do think that, as some of the other board members have mentioned, um, I, I don't think this is sustainable. Um, and uh, what I'd like to see is, is something from you you know what needs to be added back in oh, in, we'll in, yes. in the future so that we can kind of we can kind of put those somewhere out there so we know that you know as funds become available for us to continue to be a high performing district we're going to have to start plugging in back in these positions into the budget um, and why because as you said technology is going to advance and, and as we develop as a high performing district some of these positions may completely evolve or change or not be needed anymore and that's good that's a good thing um, and and some of that supervision can go down to the site and and and, and people can do some of that stuff that that maybe you needed a, a administrative person for uh, in the past that you don't need in the future but but a lot of these positions I think are were needed positions and and we need to be aware of you know what comes first on the list of plugging these back in in the future uh, and why that why that is because because I think we are going to have to do that so I, th I believe this board's been so fortunate that as we've brought concerns issues <coughs> forward and and looked straight at you dr. Ritter and said we'd like to see this done can you handle that sure. yes yeah, sure cabinet can you handle that sure I just think we're going to have to be prepared to be told no. No. <laughs> <laughs> and by that I mean um, when to answer or to, talking about some of Mr. Hosmer's points, um, you may have to come back to us as I'm understanding from this and to say, as a matter of fact, we won't be able to do that. That's just something that will not be part of the plate uh, because it's, it's, it's been part of a high performing district. It's just simply not going to be part of this district for we hope to be a short foreseeable future but but I really I, I think the the what I'm looking for here is as these things roll out and maybe there's some nuances made to it we we have a better understanding of how how what is really going to be um, eliminated or what is no longer going to be available to us as a resource tool uh, so I think it's it's a 
I don't want to say that this isn't an opportunity to, to and it is, to rethink uh, the restructure of, of administration, uh, cabinet, and duties. But I think we're all going to have to get it in our head, as I'm hearing tonight, that we're going to have to be told no. I really don't have a problem with that. <coughs> saying no. So I, I do want to bring up a point, though, along the you were just saying. Uh, we have outstanding teachers in our, in our system. The technology that they have now with the smart board and also with the data that they have at their fingertips um, has really brought a lot of decision making to the classroom that wasn't there before. And so what's going to be interesting is to see how that decision making is going to drive our changes. And I think it's mature enough now to where um, I think the uh, <coughs> What we're going to miss is the new staff coming in, and, and we're going to, we still have a step up in place to help us with that. But I do think it's going to give us a different dynamic to look at and uh, a different way to say no and yes. So thank you. Anybody else? Um, oh, yeah, I would just uh, recall from an earlier budget discussion that we had at this table talking about revenue projections and some possible cuts that we might consider to accommodate those reductions. Mrs. Callan, I believe, said that we can't sit here and talk about $10,000 here and $20,000 there and even $100,000 over here. We need to talk about substantial cuts on the magnitude of a million dollars. And uh, if anyone thinks that this is the end of it, this, this is not the end of it. This is, this is a part of it, but this, uh, this could be a, a, a large part of it. Uh, this should not be seen as a justification for those in the community who think that this this district is a top heavy with administrators. It just simply is not. And this list of positions that are being eliminated should not be seen as a justification we have too many administrators. Because it seems to me that these cuts absolutely will impact services to the sites from central office, but also impact services to the community as a whole. But I think more importantly, we're going to see an impact on the classroom. It may well, likely will impact student achievement, uh, attendance, persistence, graduation, all those services that we've been working very hard over the years to improve, all those parameters we've been working to, to raise our score. And we're going to see that, if not stagnate, perhaps even slip back. And uh, like some of the other board members here said, I, I, I hope that administration, I expect that administration will keep the board apprised of what those impacts are. We need to know that, and by extension, our community needs to know what those impacts are. These, are. these are real serious cuts. These are real serious times for real serious cuts. And I think that, uh, that the better informed that we, and by extension, the entire community are informed about what impact these cuts really have, then I think we'll be able to make better decisions going forward. Also, I think, as Mr. Mr. Hosmer said, we, we do need to have a plan for adding some of this staff back. And I know you thought about that. I, we've had these discussions. I know you thought about that. But I think, I think the community needs to be aware that we will have a plan for putting some of these services back in place when revenue pictures improve, as, as inevitably they will. The only, the only caution I, I have for all of you is, and I, that's what I was trying to uh, reiterate with uh, Mrs. Twitty, is that as it evolves, as the needs are defining where we need to go, that plan will be changing. And so that's good. But at least some kind of target will be there, but it'll be changing. So High performing systems are flexible, right, Dr. Ritter? <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Very flexible. That's what we're doing right now. So. At, at, the, at the sake, it's more? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At, <clears throat> now, what am I going to say, right? Yeah. Everything's been said almost. Just a couple of things I, I would like to to address. One is even in the economic downturn, we're talking about the economy, the demand for what we do has not decreased. I mean, we have 24,000 plus kids to educate whether economic times are good or economic times are bad. And I think that's a little bit of difference that we see sometimes. Our demand doesn't change for what we are doing. And, and I think sometimes people think, well, you, you tighten your belt like everybody else does. And I know re we have to because of revenues, but our requirements don't change, our expectations don't change, our sales don't change, whatever you want to say, however you want to say it, that we still got 24,000 kids to educate. And, and I, Mr. Renner brought up a good point about the mobility, which an interesting statistics that, that I heard, 
Ms. Kissinger may correct me, but you know, we, day one and today we got 24,000 plus kids, but we've seen actually 28 or 29,000 different kids. So we're talking about five or 6,000 different kids that aren't in the system during the fall one semester. And we're talking about mobility and changing kids. While our enrollment is stagnant, the kids are coming in and out and they're different. And I, the burden on teachers, I mean, it's a revolving door. And so I know that's a difficult thing for them um, to be able to perform in a classroom. It's, I, it, it hats off to them for what they have to do and what they uh, see every day. Um, I think it's a really good point that we are lean. I mean, just look at, I mean, we have 45% more students per administrator than the state. And so, and I think that's pretty profound. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, I'm not sure that's good or bad. Good. Uh, well, so I mean, it may be. It may be that we are not providing services and support to the, to the teachers and the classrooms and the buildings like we should be because I like everybody else said, this will impact classroom. We may talk about it where we're staying away from the classroom. <clears throat> this will impact, impact classroom, uh, maybe indirect, but ultimately it's not sustainable long-term without having some negative impact on graduation rate or <clears throat> student achievement, uh, the key things that we're talking about. So <clears throat> while I appreciate all the effort that you and your staff, and I do appreciate all the effort that you guys have done, and I, I think this is great. Uh, it's a start. I don't think it's the end, as Dr. Holman said, of our budget woes. This is not the solution or silver bullet. Uh, but I think it's important for us to continue to look at um, this being a temporary effort uh, and, and uh, not a long-term solution. And uh, so, you know, it's back to doing less with less. And uh, we're just uh, I thought about Ms. Twitty's comment about you just need to tell us no sometimes but uh, no we can't do that so I uh, you know good and bad to this uh, one final comment for me anyway and, and that is that that you know we've we've talked about this thought about this I mean the the elephant in the room is you know there there are two ways to to reach that budget one of those ways is to cut and cut and cut and cut. And at some point in time, um, I would hope the community would say to us, you've cut enough. You're impacting my student. You're impacting me as a board member, a third grader and a kindergartner. And, and it's analogous to the presentation from High Street Baptist Church and said, there's a need. And they went to their community and said, do you want to fill this need? And their community said, yes, we do. And when they got there, they went and they've gone back with a bigger need and said, do you want to fill this need? And it's very analogous. Schools are very analogous. You know, we've got a need and, and I, we want to be efficient. We want to be effective. We want to understand the, the economic situation many of our constituents are faced with. But at the same time, when is enough enough? You know, when, when do we, when have we cut too much? Um, and, you know, when do we reach that slippery slope of, 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 you know, funding where, you know, major impacts start happening and then they start cascading and they start rolling down the hill because we you talk about, you know, uh, big urban districts and, and that, that start of that and you don't want to be going on the other side of that hill. So, you know, I, I, I think this board needs to have a serious discussion about, you know, when is, when are these cuts too much? When can we just not, either cannot bear it or should not inflict it on our kids? Because that's what we're doing by, you know, we try to be as upbeat as we can about these cuts that we can, we can make it work. And we've made it work for four years now. And we're, we're keeping the ship afloat. But, but what do our kids deserve? What do 24,000 students deserve every day? Do they deserve a ship that's afloat? Or do they deserve a ship that's sailing for, you know, uncharted waters? I mean, that's, that's where I want that ship to be sailing. I don't want it to be tattered and floating around in the ocean. 
And I think that's kind of what this school district and the school districts across the country are facing. And, 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 I, and I think we've got to start having that discussion about going to that community and saying, hey, we've got a need. And, and what do you want to do about it? Because it's not right to these kids to continue to cut um, needed services. If I may, uh, I'm closing. Everybody done? I'm, I'm closing. I just want to bring up a couple of things. First of all, uh, Robertson, Campbell, Weller, outstanding schools, outstanding performance. Some of, some of our top performing schools, and they're our poorest schools. Why are they doing so well? The staff is doing an exceptional job, good leadership, great community support, partnership as we heard earlier. The ECHO program coming from our Community Foundation of the Ozarks, 100,000 a year supporting uh, both Campbell and Robertson. And uh, Dr. Pretty, you know what I'm talking about. That's a major part of uh, the achievement that we're seeing in those schools. And Weller, of course, is really, really <coughs> very much into uh, student ownership and <coughs> engagement. And so my concern is, is, and hopefully, because basically the CFO is gonna pull out of that ECHO program, uh, project this year. This is their last year as far as uh, ECHO is concerned. And so that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm concerned about those schools and, and those children and what's going on there. So hopefully the community, as Mr. Hosmer is talking about, hopefully the community will rally around our, our system and our schools and continue to partner and show support. And I really think that's a major part or major reason why we have such strong achievement. Another thing I want to point out, last thing, is that as you look at a family that is really struggling, you know, and I work at St. Joe's as a, as a deacon, and it's a very poor parish. And as I think about the families there and the struggling, struggles they've had over the last 18 months, it's very similar to what we're going through as a system. And they're making decisions, they're doing some planning, they're cutting back, and we're doing the same thing. And so, but I'm starting to see some, some hope there, some, some things that are happening in that, in that church. In other words, people are going to work, people are getting jobs, things are starting to take off. And I have a feeling that's what we're gonna see ultimately in the next 18 months, hopefully anyway. So I wanna thank you for this time and we're gonna have many opportunities to have this conversation, needless to say, between now and, and July 1st. Thank you. Moving on to informational item, 6.01 Staff mm -hmm. Development Program Evaluation. <clears throat> Mr. Lee, board members, and Dr. Ritter, uh, as you know, MSIP Standard 8.1 and Board of Education Policy IM require the goals of programs and services to be reviewed every other year by the board. In January, every other year is the time we bring the Staff Development Program Evaluation. You receive that through board docs. It's available to community through board docs and will be posted on the SPS website uh, shortly after this meeting. And we are here to answer any questions that you might have about the staff development program evaluation. Question, Ms. Callan. It's not a question, it's just a comment. I mean, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. When, I mean, one of, one of my responsibilities that I've always felt on the board uh, as a board member is to also be a good employer. And when people start in our district and you go to the retirement, um, well, what we used to have as a retirement dinner, yeah, it's one of the things that we that cut. four years ago. But, you know, as you look at the recognition as people retire and they've been with our system 25, 27, 30 years, you realize what a responsibility we have to help people be the professionals that they wanna be. And, um, you know, you look at this document and you see the kind of responses um, from, you know, real teachers, real people participating about what this professional development in a variety of programs um, means to them. Um, and means to them as teachers and means to them as professionals who want to improve in their profession. Um, 
and it, it's it's impressive and um, I just like to make a comment that um, you know I know that that will be impacted with the cuts that um, Dr. Ritter just proposed and so to try to say that this won't impact the classroom it will impact the classroom because it impacts the very people that we put in that classroom to, to guide that learning so um, that's the piece that's disappointing to me to to have this report and you know this kind of information shared with us on the very night that we're talking about having to make cuts to that you know that's that's the hard part about sitting up here Dr. Well, I want to second what Chris had to say because when you look at at the attrition rate going from 30 down to 9 percent that's a huge plus but I think even more important for us uh, numbers type people is um, uh, you know the cost savings that you've generated yeah. <laughs> uh, 914,000 915,000 dollars in cost savings by keeping the employees employed that ought to be employed keeping them effective and letting the ones who uh, maybe can find a better career out um, do you have can you give any financial impact on what you think these may make on on this cost savings we've enjoyed over the past few years the um, <clears throat> primary reduction in step up for next year based on the initial look at what we're going to reduce is what we call tier three so if you look on page 10 at the cost savings analysis you'll notice that in tier three our calculated or estimated uh, net savings for that third tier currently is about $151,000. So we will look to um, eliminate that cost savings, approximately $150,000 by the reductions that we'll be making. And we're primarily, because if you look at our results, our greatest results are typically, we have great results all three of the tiers, but our greatest results and most important portion of that program are obviously in tier one and tier two, their first and second year. And some of those that are in second year, they finish their work in their third year. So we typically call it tier one, tier two, and tier three. So at this point, we'll be maintaining tier one and tier two, and our, our cuts or elimination will be of tier three, which will account to we will lose about $151,000 in net savings, which will be offset by the cuts that we're making in staff development. So it's kind of a wash. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Kissinger? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Griffin, you give me to it? Oh, I'm sorry. January quarterly report. Thank you. I'll run the meeting back. <laughs> Good evening. It's my pleasure to present to you the second quarterly report for the 2010-2011 school year. The uh, <coughs> report encompasses the uh, indicators and measures as identified as part of uh, SP5. And for this evening's report, as customary, we are bringing forward to you the updates, uh, areas needing further study, highlights, uh, opportunities for improvement, and strengths. In organizing the presentation, We've grouped them as such for this evening. Our updates include uh, some looks at the <coughs> performance series from a cohort perspective, as well as an initial baseline of using kind of an indicator report uh, placement approach, uh, both of which are somewhat in response to uh, inquiries that the board has made previously and having a chance to see these results. In the opportunities for improvement uh, section, we have the graduation rate and the attendance rate listed, and both of those are based on comparable performance, which I'll get into. And then finally, in the strengths, we have ACT comparable performance, which looks at the composite overall and then also specific content areas. So the first update then, uh, as kind of the procedure we follow, the page numbers uh, within the report are referenced. Uh, I want to give you an update related to the uh, cohort look of performance series. And really, when we bring in this cohort perspective, uh, we want to bring it uh, across this 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 time bringing in the BOI results for 2010-2011 because we have a full year behind us from 09-10 and now we're starting to make the turn for multiple points. And so the um, representation you see presented here 
shows our communication arts results, which are disaggregated from a reading and a language arts uh, perspective. Both elements go in to make the communication arts. So we see reading in green, we see um, language arts in red. And when we look at this here, what we're looking at from, a, from the perspective of how the, the charts are laid out is that this grouping at the bottom, so we see 4G, 10, 11, those are fourth graders in the 2010-2011 school year. And so we see then the average beginning of year scaled score average for them for this year. At the same point, if we go back a point, we see those kids at the end of third grade, at the middle of third grade, at the beginning of third grade. And so this cohort look is brought out in that way. Uh, there is an asterisk on this one because this is also an, uh, an indicator identified as, a, as an area needing further study, and that qualification for the area needing further study is the essential gap that you see between reading and language arts at the cohort level as we go through the grades. And so I guess the best way to describe that is kind of a, an opening up or a spread as we go across the grade level. These assessments are scaled the same. They range from 1,300 to 3,700. And so we can compare the scaled scores uh, equivocally. Real quickly, what is the, is there a typical <coughs> year of growth? Is that 100? Yeah, we, uh, within the gains piece, there is kind of a, what you call expected gains. Those are actually disaggregated on the uh, beginning of your placement of the student on a, a quartile piece. So imagine if we have, you know, the, the sampling of kids, the gains come in based on where the kids start, and we will be presenting those gains in the future once we have the, the, the first round of gains. We're in our mid-year testing now. Um, so it's tough to say it's 100. It varies by content area and by grade level, but it is based off of national work research into the assessment. So we do have a benchmark for gains. Don't go away from that one yep. yet. Am I reading it right? I think I understand that, that what we're seeing from end of year to beginning of the next year, especially in language arts, is people tend to backslide a little bit over the summer in performance. Yep. The, Not so much in reading, but more in language arts. Yeah. Given that it is has an equivalent scale across grade levels and across time, if you see you know two points together as flat, that means they're if, if the, fir the last dot here is the beginning of year, the previous one's the end of year, that means they're starting the next year at the same score they were before. So if it, was le if it was down, that means the beginning of year score is lower than where the average was previously. And so that would, so a drop in this case would be coming off of summer. Yeah. The, the next piece, just to tie onto that, brings in the math because I think that drop is actually more yep. accentuated um, looking at end of year to beginning of year. So this is not, a, you know, it's not a sleight of hand here. These are scaled the same as far as how I'm displaying for you, 2,000 to 3,000. And so there you see reading language, there you see math. Yeah. And so that drop, so to speak, is more evident in math. The second update is also coming off the performance series, and this deals with um, presenting a baseline of, of placement indicators. Uh, previously, we have had, um, in, in bringing presentations forward to you, whether it's performance or MAP, uh, this idea of achievement levels of below basic, basic, proficient, and advanced, and we've had um, discussion related to the idea of those standards of below basic, basic, proficient, and advanced, and grade level. You know, is proficient grade level, or how does that kind of fall? And as we looked at, uh, and actually I think it was in the first quarterly report for this year, we kind of gave the descriptors of what, you know, what does basic mean at third grade math or advanced at eighth grade com arts. And there was still, uh, still a little bit further that it, that it seemed we needed to go to get at this idea of being at grade level. So we looked to the assessment itself to see um, can we get some guidance off of the assessment we're given three times a year as to what grade level falls and kind of how that goes. And so that's what the placement indicator work reflects. I am going to have to give just a slight bit of detail on the background of it to, to make the interpretation of it valid for you. Uh, so through kind of national norm research from Scantron, who is the vendor of the assessment, they have identified scaled scores associated with the category names, and these are their category names of advanced, at risk, and grade level. And so when we go in there, these, these placement indicators are 
fundamentally driven by the scaled scores. So those same scores I showed you a minute ago with the line charts, that's, you know, that's the basic kernel of the assessment is the scaled score. But in assessments, you can transform scaled scores into many different types of metrics, one of which that many people are common with are national percentile ranks, re referred to as NPRs. And so that's where you say, well, a student scoring at the 50th percentile scored higher than 50% of the same age base kids at the same point in time on that assessment. So Scantron with the assessment has taken the scaled scores to the percentile ranks in, in coming to these uh, placement indicators. And so that NPR is a comparison point relative to a national sample. And that's the advantage of the Scantron assessment. It's not just a Missouri assessment. It is reflects a national approach. So how Scantron defines these levels is, becomes kind of key. And in reading this and in, in preparing and trying to find, you know, how can we get at this grade level piece, this is where it kind of stood out to us. Uh, on the at-risk side, uh, Scantron identifies students scoring in this range as those that are scoring below the interquartile range, and that's nothing to be uh, scared of. I'll, I'll bring it into plain English momentarily. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, at this level, students risk not being able to, to make progress at the same rate as their peers. So that's what they're meaning by at-risk. Those that they identify as grade level, essentially fall within the interquartile range, and that means they fall between the 25th and the 75th percentile, so, or the middle 50% of kids. And the key part in their definition is that underlined piece there, that students within this range are performing similarly to their peers, and those peers being age and uh, uh, grade level appropriate. Finally, at the advanced part, the advanced is designated by the 95th percentile. So as we, we came across this placement indicator work and began to dig into it, this seemed to get at this idea of grade level. However, the, um, the scaled scores or the NPRs, uh, there's a spot <coughs> between grade level and advanced, which essentially falls from the 75th to the 95th percentile that they're not giving us a representation on of these placement indicators. So we added one more la layer to it, and we created one called above grade level, which reflects the percentiles between 75th and 95th. And the reason for doing so is we want to be able to give you the full population out of 100%. I don't want to be able to say, this reflects the scores of kids from the first percentile to the 74th and the 95th and above. I'd just as soon be able to say, this reflects the full population. And if kids are on grade level from the 25th to 75th, we can say above grade level, 75th to 94th. So having said all that, a quick table to reference. The uh, Scantron indicators are the second row there. The ones that I'm going to report for you here follow and use the categories of below grade level, on grade level, above, and advanced, because those are, those are relatively uh, systemic terms that we're generally kind of used to. But you can see how they fall relative to the percentiles or relative to what Scantron calls on their placement indicators. Dr. Uh, Fred, this then assumes that they're me we're measuring Scantron clients, students, scores. Do we know that the Scantron districts are a, a, a pretty heterogeneous mix? Are they, are they? It was, a, it was a nationally representative sample, and they don't update them each time through, so it's not like they come out with a new baseline to say, you know, here's the, here's the new norm. It was based, I believe, off of 0506 is when they normed the assessment, which is kind of common practice. You norm it ever so often. And so, um, you know, I, I, would, I have as much confidence in their sample as I would in any large-scale assessment company in norming a test. Mr. Lynch. Make sure I understand the, the placement indicators are two parts. One is the magnitude of where they are and then the rate of change or rate of improvement. It yep. We can get, we will get to the rate of change piece when we bring you back the mid-year results okay. because that is actually right. the next level uh, that, and this actually goes where Mr. Hosmer was asking on this idea of kind of standard gain. Scantron has that essentially benchmarked out here what is the expected amount of gain for a student scoring below the 25th percentile as a fourth grader in math? And that's different than a kid at the 25th, below the 25th percentile as a fifth grader in math. So, yeah, there, in time we will bring those kind of, that I mean, kind of piece to sort of equally weighted type thing? Because, I mean, I can see a, a student starting low and, and seeing incredible improvement. Right which is a great thing, mm -hmm. even though they started significantly lower, but when you look at the, where they started, that's not necessarily good, but the right. rate of change is exceptional. Yeah, the, with a big caveat given, I'll give it with a big caveat, that said, you know, there, there is 
variation by the grade levels and the content areas. But the general rule that we see on the expected amounts of gains is kind of like a set of stairs going down. So how much is expected for quartile one is X amount. I'll call it 150. Quartile two, maybe it's 100. Quartile three, maybe 75. Quartile four, maybe 25. And so it's kind of like, it, you could use the same NPR perspective. Let's say we have percentile <laughs> ranks that fall from one to 99. If I'm scoring at the 95th percentile, it's more difficult for me to gain four percentile to get to the 99th than if I'm at the fifth percentile to get to the ninth. And I think that's kind of where, that's where you were going yes, as well. Yes. So having- And having you're comfortable with that research that, that, that shows what that average gain should be in different grades and different levels? Yeah, it's also coming off of their national work. And so again, assuming we have this, this big national, nationally representative sample, you know, of testing them multiple times throughout, uh, that's where they're pulling that off of, so yes. <clears throat> so to take it then to what the results show from this idea of below, on, above, and advanced, we can see, and I've, I've laid it out here for you, just kind of rapid fire of language arts, reading, and math. We're seeing essentially the green, the light green, the dark green, and the blue reflect our on, above, or advanced. And so in the area of language arts, and we're showing you here end of year, um, on these placement indicators, and they do, I, I noted this in the, the text, these, these scaled score ranges associated with these indicators do vary um, at the different times of the year. So they are expecting, you know, a change in the score, so to speak, to, to move your level. Uh, we can see that essentially we kind of run the gamut from 30 to uh, about 18 percent, but kind of in this 20 percent range of students in the below grade level. So if we do the inverse of that, we can see we're talking in the 70 to 80 percent kind of range of students on or above um, the standard or IE grade level. That's language arts. We can see the reading falls pretty much right at 20 uh, through elementary, and then we go 18, 16, 18. Uh, at middle, and then finally at math, uh, we stay pretty steady with 16, 15, 14, 15. So if we go kind of back again, language arts, we're talking generally about 80% on the reading side, also about 80%, upwards of 84%, uh, and then on the math side, 85, 86% on or above grade level. Now I know that was mouthful, so. But do we know how that compares I mean, Map. pardon me. Well, do we know how that compares to other districts? I mean, is that good? Is that bad? Is that just yeah. information? Yeah, that's why we have to call it the baseline because we really, to, to know of um, the same testing protocol and doing multiple times a year, we really don't have a, uh, a, a partner, so to speak, at the dance, you know. Because to, to our, traditional, our traditional benchmark districts don't necessarily assess this way, is that right? Well, we'd need two things. One, we'd need them to be using the same assessment. Two, we'd need them to be giving the assessment in generally the same times as we are, you know, that we're calling beginning, beginning, middle, and end. Three, we'd need to make sure they're testing the full population like we are. And then uh, fourthly, we'd have to share the data back and forth. We do have Missouri districts that are giving the assessment. Uh, we, we meet with them a couple times a year in what we call a Missouri user group. Uh, and off the top of my head, I can't think of anybody in that group that's running the, the testing system the way we are to be able to say, hey, let me see your results. I mean, I have visited with uh, some of those districts about some partnerships, but we're not at a spot where I could get a benchmark on that. That seems a little problematic because then we never, I mean, I mean, I guess then you're just always comparing yourself to yourself, yeah, which is, is, one way to com it is one way to do a comparison. Right, but. so where we'd bring in this piece then would be when we, we get to end of year this year, or if we even wanted to run it against the beginning of year results this year. We, you know, we could, we could take it in and say, okay, well, we knew we got 15.4%, 15.5% below at sixth grade at the end of the year last year. How does that look end of year this year? Kind of as a reference point. But you're staying, I mean, the, the Scantron is basically a bell shaped curve. Yeah, anything with percentiles 50, are. 20, it's a bell yeah. shaped curve. So, I mean, that's, and I'm not saying that's a, I don't, I hope we don't have bell shaped curve students, but 
you know, I want everybody to be on grade level or, or higher. Right. But um, I mean, that's the only comparison we've got is what that standard is and what we are to ourselves. But uh, think, yeah. From a progression standpoint, that's yeah, not an accident. Right now, so. yeah. well, I think they, you may they, they describe that phenomenon as uh, uh, Doug Reeves, who has been, you know, we've drawn upon his work heavily in this district for many years. He had a, a title that he called to refer to that phenomenon as from the, he called it from the bell curve to the mountain. And so, you know, you've got, as you described, a, a, a evenly distributed piece. What we want to do is we want to move essentially the tail all the way to 50, you know, and to where that thing is <coughs> spiking or at least constantly rolling up. I'm sorry, Dr. Ritter. What's kind of interesting is you look at the third grade numbers and you look at the, the below grade level and that really is our percentage of graduation. When you, when you subtract uh, 17, it's 83, 83%. It's kind of interesting. And, and you, as you look across the board, that's pretty pretty much where it's at. Good indicator. It's a good indicator. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. it really is. I think it's, it's really something we probably should watch and chart. Uh, speaking of graduation rate moves us to the opportunity for improvement and within the graduation rate uh, as in previous years we continue to see our uh, our increase our movements upward the the opportunity for improvement though falls in based on our of our definition uh, relative to comparable performance and we're not meeting or exceeding the majority of comparable districts we are however uh, ahead of one Hazelwood in this case and you can see kind of the movement we're taking but given that uh, definition requires us to look at performance relative to the comparables, uh, still does not uh, meet there, but progress is certainly made. Similarly, um, attendance rate falls in the uh, same category where in Springfield <coughs> falling blue, we can see um, meeting exceeding the majority of comparables. And so were we um, uh, kind of similar to where Columbia fell, or basically where we had been last year, we can see that that would have fell. But given that we have uh, essentially only one district lower than us, we're not meeting or exceeding. Uh, recall that we did kind of give a running report on the attendance piece last year um, that we would kind of bring forward in these quarterly reports, because it had previously <coughs> been identified as an opportunity for improvement. And we had that October kind of flu piece that hit us pretty hard and, and really took, you know, kind of took a while to, to turn that ship. Uh, on the strength side, uh, go through, through these rather quickly, we have ACT <coughs> composite and the content areas, and this is also about the comparable performance. So to begin with, uh, looking here at our comparables as well as Missouri and the nation, since we do have a national average, um, and the regional cohort reflects an average of those regional cohort members, we can see that uh, our performance uh, once again has fallen um, just below Columbia and Rockwood, and yet, again, exceeding the majority of comparables. And this is for the composite, the overall average. Uh, when we go into the content strand specific, so here we see English, we only get a Missouri and a national comparison here. We can see across all the content strands that performance uh, remains above state and nation. Uh, and I do have an asterisk on one coming here, so I'm going to go through these a little quickly. We have English, math, and I should, I'm sorry, I should have pointed to you, these are scaled the same, 24 to 20. Uh, so if you're seeing the movement, that is reflective of the performance relative to the other. English, math, science. And then the reading has an asterisk by it, and so this is denoting also uh, an area needing further study. We are seeing two points down from the 07, 08 peak, so we're not at a spot to, to call it an OFI or to necessarily sound the alarm, but it is something that is on the radar and that we will, as the title says, study and uh, dig into a little bit deeper. Uh, so in summation then, we see that we presented some updates related to the cohort perspective of performance series across the content areas, as well as a baseline on these placement indicators from performance series. The OFIs of graduation rate and attendance rate for comparable performance. Areas needing further study were also noted. And then finally, on the strength side is where the ACT measures fall of the composite and the content areas. And I'd be happy to take any questions or, or go further on any of those. Uh, uh, not really a question. It's just that it, uh, I think as we talked about um, the mobility rate in 20 to 25 percent of the kids have already changed in our district, which 
could be another 20 to 25 percent by the end so that's 40 to 50 percent the kids that are in the classroom would be different than those at the beginning and it's always interesting to me if we can and we can do this now with our system that those that are in the same school in the same room how they do and grow and others that come in at different times because if they're not there at the beginning then we don't have a beginning score on them we may have a mid-year score on them or we may have an ending score on them and so I think as we look at that data we have to if our district is changing to where we really have that much mobility now if some of its between schools I think that's interesting to look at uh, but if it's those that are actually moving in and and we didn't have them before as we start to look at that then we need to be able to break that out to look at the students that stay in a building stay within the system and then the other group that's coming in and out that we have for a two and three weeks or a month or six weeks or whatever and we invest time money um, teacher time with those kids and they're now gone you know so I think uh, once our mobility rate has gotten to the point that we see it now we're going to have to look at that and see does that what does that do you know does that take away do you have to spend a whole lot more time as you get a couple kids in that weren't in the system and you have no data on them you don't know where they are you're trying to find out where they're reading what they're doing and you get that information you finally get it six weeks later they're gone again you know and do you invest more time in them than you do in the kids that have been there the whole time so I mean I'm not a huge data person I understand why you use this data and now why it's so important because then we can determine you know where should we invest our time what what should we do but I think now we have a system where we can also you can tell us you know if you just took the students that were in the classroom and stayed there look at their growth as compared to the others and we can't um, we can't refuse them to enter but what do we do when they come and how much time and what do we do to to help them so I, I think it's I mean I, I think it's good but I think that other piece of information we have to really keep in mind as we're looking at this data also and I, I would add two comments to kind of get at that from what we've seen we have we prepared and been working with principals in terms of kind of understanding how to start these growth this look at growth on this quartile piece with different expectations and it would be a lot harder uh, no doubt if we didn't have the systems that could kind of mass produce and make it available for them but in preparation for those results and in kind of digging at that there it, it surfaced and brought out some pieces that we really hadn't had a chance to look at and so for example the growth expectations are set off of the beginning of your score so if you don't have a beginning of your score like if I'm a student and I'm not bringing that beginning of your score with me because I'm coming in January where do I fall in the you know the growth trajectory is it half of what it was or you know divided by the number of days and so on and so forth uh, and so it, it would essentially kind of open up this full population that you know hadn't been there for the the, the full treatment the full design of, of what the curriculum is what the instruction is you know so um, so that'll be kind of one piece and and I don't really know how what the reporting side of that looks like that'll you know we'll hope to have an answer for you with that on the third quarterly report but I could envision kind of a pool of kids that that we don't have a baseline on to be able to give so there's there's kind of one piece the second piece is that um, on this idea of the mobility it's much easier in using the data when they are an in-house student so if it's an in-district transfer because they're bringing that score with them so the general process follows that the student transfers to another school so they go from school A to school B if they're in-house once they're enrolled in in our student information system the next night and they're assigned to meet the teacher the next day their stuff is their stuff their data that they bring with them is available to me so the timeliness of that really couldn't I mean short of carrying it on a card and you know laying it down with them on enrollment but the you're right the out-of-district piece or out-of-state piece um, 
that, that, that's certainly a struggle. A couple things. One, uh, in, you and I had some email exchanges on this, but the the, the drop off from end of year to beginning of year, and, and we we looked and we saw that actually reading kind of strangely went up, which you really wouldn't expect, I guess, over the summer, but we see in a lot of the cases it did go up. But but the drops in, in math, and if you look at it one way, you go from 2,400 to 2,300, doesn't look that bad. But then if you look at where they're starting, where they, the, the gain they made during the year, and you take the drop off from the end of the year to the beginning of the year next year, you know, I did some of the calculations, and I think I sent you back an email saying that some of those were 33%, 30% that that the they'd lost kids had lost 30 percent of what they'd learned in math during that so if they gained 100 points they were down to 70 when they started the next year so i guess what i'd like somebody to do is come back and see whether or not that is a significant i mean if that's something we all kind of know that happens but but you know 30 percent seems like a a big drop off and maybe it's not maybe it's a it's, it's comparable or, or maybe it's not something we need to spend too much time on but you know as we go forward and try to be a high performing district if you're getting up to a hundred percent and dropping back down to 70 just by going home for the summer uh, then then maybe that's a, a concern that, that we should be looking at the other thing that uh, one of the, the, the things I like about this data is you talk about mobility I mean I'm assuming that you could start reporting some of these growth patterns only with students that were there for a yep. specific number of days so that in addition to seeing the, the the gross data we could say okay well let's also pull it out and show that you know if you just look at the kids that really had the ability to to be educated this whole year here's what here's what their growth was so I think that's one of the exciting things that, that we're hopefully going to use the data for um, and the other thing is is and I don't know if there's a, a System wide, we've got this data now of these. You know, we saw the 30 20 percent of the kids in third grade that are below below basic. Whether or not we're making sure that, that we've got red flags on every one of those kids, and that each school that then gets those kids in fourth grade and fifth grade, that, that the principal and the teachers and everybody knows that this kid's got a red flag on them. And, and, and they've got to figure out, you talk to response to intervention and the, the different strategies, differentiated instruction, but that realization that everybody's aware because you've got that ease of getting, accessing that data and the, and the data follows the kid, right, right? Uh, longitudinally. So, you know, we can make all sorts of uh, assumptions based on, you know, how many of those kids are actually showing growth and it's, you know, some, it can be attributable to something other than their abilities and some you know, uh, and kids that need that special attention. So, I mean, I hope that system-wide we're, now that we've got this great data that, that, that everybody's putting a red flag on, on these kids and we're, we're starting to make, make sure that, that, you know, that 20% becomes 17%, becomes 15%, becomes zero uh, because you've got that ability to immediately see that. Yeah, I, I want to reiterate, I had written down the beginning year, middle of the year, end of year, and the, end, um, the impact on what happens when a child moves. <clears throat> and I know that even if they move within our system, we still have access to the data, but that doesn't mean that that move hasn't impacted that child. And I think I read um, some literature at some time that says every time a child moves um, classrooms, it sets them back close to six months both socially and um, academically. I'd, I'd like to see I'd like to see some data on that. I think the other thing is we've thrown around um, <clears throat> mobility and, and some figures tonight. I think we I'd like to, us to be cautious and I'd like to really see the hard data on that and what what it is because I think you know sometimes we can operate on an assumption. Um, but I agree I'd like to start seeing some of this data presented to us. Um, to show where the impact is. I mean, if we, and it's something that I've sensed um, from the very beginning, if we have children that start with us in kindergarten and finish with us in um, 12th grade, most of those children are very successful, you know, or, or go on to some, some good options for them. And so um, 
you know, you got to think that starting with at least having them a year <laughs> um, and what that means. And I think, again, this is just signs of the economic times as families move around to try to make their family situation um, work. But um, I think that's I think data we, that would be worth us having. I think we have teachers who actually have that data for you <clears throat> and keep track of their kids. And so I, I think we could probably isolate zero in on some teachers and they could give you that data. But we'll, we'll look into it. I just, just one further com comment, and, and, and that's the appreciation that I have that the, the ability this data gives us to have questions answered. And, and a couple of weeks ago, I'd, I'd read a book and I'd read study about the drop off from, from end of year to beginning year and the fact that the drop off was a lot more severe with, with with poor kids than it was with with kids that weren't poor and I immediately sent an email to Anita she sent it every, within a couple of days I had the statistics back and 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 we disaggregated the free and reduced population with the, the other population to see the numbers and and I said well maybe what they were talking about was the really poor kids so can you get me just the free lunch and yeah sure we can get that too so uh, that ability really is is because it's what it can do is it can disabuse you of some of your notions that you read them in a study and you think well maybe this is the truth and maybe this is the way it is and you can get that data to show that in a couple of cases I certainly was wrong and the, the things that I'd read were did not show up in at least in our data set but but I certainly appreciated that as a board member and the ability to, to have a quick answer uh, real time we will have to figure out a way to be real gentle and saying no to you at times. <laughs> so, you know, as, as reminded earlier, so we will figure a way. And you'll Usually they just say it'll take weeks to get that information. <laughs> we, so. we, yeah, it'll, it'll take a year to get that. <laughs> okay. We will figure a way. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Goodman? Thank you, Dr. Goodman. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to 6.03, 2009 bond projects status report. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Ritter. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, give you the quarterly update on the 2009 bond projects. Um, you have the full report in board docs, so I'm just going to touch on some of the highlights for you this evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, touch on the air conditioning projects. Uh, here is a list of the air conditioning projects that make up the 2009 bond projects. Uh, Jared and Reed, it's hard to tell on the slide, I apologize, but Jared and Reed are uh, highlighted as they are already substantially complete. And uh, the other projects are uh, finalizing in design and are going to be bidding out shortly. Uh, Robertson is the next project that is going to be uh, out to bid as far as our air conditioning. Um, the Robertson project is a project that is going is designed with a uh, heat pump type system. Um, as we go through life cycle cost analysis and those things, as we deal with our um, air conditioning projects, um, the engineer uh, has uh, uh, showed the life cycle analysis recommending the heat pump system. We're asked the engineer to actually bid the ground source or the well field, if you will, as an alternate so we can see what the real costs are there. As I mentioned, the life cycle costs, um, just to uh, refresh everyone's memory about what we're talking about, as we get into design, we look at the comparisons of a number of different systems that would work within those facilities, and then we look to see what the best value is uh, for us in those projects. And the items and the things that they look at when we break down what that life cycle analysis is, First of all is that initial cost of the different types of systems that they, they go across and take a look at. Secondly, we look at what future energy costs are. Now, we don't have a magic crystal ball here, but we use some uh, uh, basic understandings of what we've seen in trends and what things we do know to come in the future as we look at energy costs. We look at the annual maintenance. Every type of system is different. Different pieces of equipment require different types of maintenance. We also look at what the life of the equipment is. Pumps last a certain period of time, boilers, different periods, chillers, 
all of those things have different life costs. So then we also build in their repla replacement costs and the repairs for that equipment as well. And then we deal with inflation <coughs> over the time frame. So uh, all of these things go into making uh, that analysis and we take those things and convert them to today's dollars so we can do an apples to apples type comparison. Um, it sounds kind of easy and I've just kind of brushed over it like that, but there's a lot of work that goes into doing those uh, life cycle analysis. So I wanted to let you know what is part of what we do when we look at those projects. As we touch on the construction projects, first of all at Glendale High School, the electrical and technology infrastructure upgrades, we've just received the uh, final drawings on that work, so the, we're in the process of owner review on that. Uh, the installation of the new stadium bleachers uh, was completed. Uh, also the stadium lighting at the three high schools was completed as well. And now as we look at Hillcrest High School, uh, Hillcrest is an interesting project as it deals with a lot of renovation. We deal with the um, domestic piping in the building. We deal with uh, restroom renovation, also some renovations in the auditorium. Uh, I put this site map <coughs> up to show you. Um, this is the Hyper building here, and uh, this is where the location of the elevator for the Hyper facility is being planned. Uh, up here, uh, which is uh, to the north of the building, is where the uh, FEMA uh, and the cafeteria addition is, uh, is scheduled to be located. And as we talk about that, that space in the building, which is the, the FEMA safe room area that we are looking at, um, basically this is at the lower level. Um, so you can tell from the footprint up here on the top right of the diagram, you can see how it fits within the existing building. Um, but basically this structure along the front here and through this area is all part of the safe room for the FEMA guidelines. Uh, one of the uh, really nice pieces with this project by taking uh, the FEMA safe room into consideration is it allows us to do a lot more with that whole kitchen cafeteria area than we had hoped we could do within the original bond. Uh, as you recall, currently the kitchen and cafeteria is up on the main level of the building and you have a corridor that separates those areas. So from a circulation standpoint, uh, there's a lot of issues with that space and this really works out nicely. Uh, then it also allows us to renovate that cafeteria space on that main level for the classrooms and get them out of the basement. So uh, we're really pleased with how this project is coming along. Uh, Jeffries is another project uh, where we are um, looking at a FEMA safe room with the project. Uh, you may recall this slide from the last time I spoke with you in <coughs> where we're looking at locating the gymnasium uh, for the Jeffries project. You can see on the front of it here is actually where we're looking at relocating the office space for the building. Right now the main office is tucked in this part of the building right here. And with adding this safe room on the front, it just it gives us a nice opportunity to put the offices in the front and make a new entrance to the building, which will work better, much uh, better from a safety uh, standpoint as well. One of the challenges, we've received preliminary <coughs> approval on the Jeffries project. As far as FEMA, we have not uh, received the official. So we're kind of in a standstill a little bit uh, as to how long we can wait before we need to proceed with the project, but that's the difference of whether or not we can uh, move the offices at this point or not. So uh, we're hoping to hear any time, uh, but we just haven't heard yet. As we look at uh, one of the other things with the Jeffries project is dealing with some of the traffic issues. Uh, the uh, early childhood uh, modular uh, is up in this area, will be um, taken out. Uh, that allows us to um, deal with uh, new traffic for parent flow, helps with the backup on scenic. We're also looking at bringing the bus loop in through the back side here. And you have to forgive me, I forgot the name of that side street back here. 
uh, but bringing that in through the back so it helps us separate those and uh, we, we do have some congestion issues as we do with many schools so we always take a look at how we can improve those when we do the projects as we deal with the Westport project Westport project uh, uh, is another good project it's challenging in the fact that um, we're trying to accomplish a lot of different things with the project the uh, the coloring that you see here is basically the uh, orange or tan area would be the sections that would represent the middle school areas and this lighter gray area would be the elementary area uh, the blue would signify uh, some of the common spaces uh, here would be the library area so basically if you were to cut the facility in half on a diagonal you'd be able to see how what we have accomplished keeping the middle school section from the elementary section um, the architects are still working and trying to tighten down the square footage and trying to find different ways to uh, reduce costs on the project as we're going through it uh, we're also looking at the overall traffic flow for the situation as the main part of the uh, current building sits here in this area and, and looking at how we can potentially tie in traffic back to Hilton possibly uh, also coming up from Westport this direction through to a new front to the building uh, tying in obviously with the whole park system and working through with them so uh, again yes just a question the, the property on the east side the wooded area is that private this up here is that private city who? It, it's private there are actually three tracks of land back there the uh, I think right up to about this point is where the residential ends and then there's three tracks and those tracks actually go all the way up to chestnut so they're long narrow tracks <coughs> Uh, the next section is dealing with technology <coughs> and as we look at the technology this is with the smart board and projector installations um, currently the technology is at 19 percent as far as their completion um, uh, Rick Green and his staff update the technology website uh, page on a monthly basis to uh, keep uh, schools and staff up to speed on where they're at with their projects uh, they were kind enough to share these slides uh, where you can see at Robertson Elementary where we have students engaging in the use of the smart boards and again here's it this is at uh, Cherokee Middle School where we get to see that opportunity of how the uh, students use those spaces um, at the end of the uh, report that you have on board docs is the financial page uh, we continue to make some uh, adjustments to improve that report uh, you'll notice that we've combined the management fee piece into the overall uh, financial report uh, you will also notice that on the adjusted budget it reflects fifty million one hundred sixty nine thousand two hundred dollars uh, which is due to the interest earned uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Rick Green is here also to answer any questions related to the technology part. And with that, I thank you. Question for Mr. Wynn. Uh, question and a, and a request, I guess. Uh, the life cycle costs that you alluded to, uh, you know, one of the, in terms of the energy piece, the, the energy costs going forward, one of the things we know is going to happen in the next three years two three years is a 21 percent increase in in energy i mean cu's already already announced that um, uh, in addition to any other increases has that been factored into the life cycle cost in the that that, that you've done for these projects yes okay. um, uh, second um, i understand and i think i told you that i talked to the Raytown South superintendent at a Missouri School Board Association and he was telling me about ground source and they'd gone to ground source and thought it was a no-brainer saved all sorts of money I understand Jack Henry is now doing everything ground source and getting a four-year payback on on their ground source um, one of the things that I'd like to see I know there's savings there and and whether or not the life cycle works out and I've seen some of those documents you've shown me but one of the things and Jerry brought this up is that 
is that energy savings we realize with the ground source system, we realize those savings immediately in operating costs because we're reducing our energy costs even though we're paying for those that upfront cost out of the bond proceeds. Is that correct? Correct. So, I mean, that's one thing, you know, you save energy and multiple schools and, and businesses are, are doing this and, and telling me it's a no-brainer, 75% of the energy is free because it's produced under the ground. Um, uh, and if we can, if we can see that at least as a an alternate all I'd like to see it as an alternate all these projects going forward so that the board can make the decision to say maybe we want to pay that up front because we know we're going to get a bang immediately when we turn the air conditioning on at these schools because we're going to save actual dollars in our budget am I correct there well and Robertson is and, and one of the reasons we're putting that project out next is because it does have the ground source built in as an alternate. One of the complicating things with doing that is on some of the other projects where the engineers are re recommending a different type of system, it's not just a matter of changing out to a well field um, because the internal components may or may not be compatible with what you would do in a typical ground source type system. So we're, we're putting Robertson out that way first so we can see firsthand what the real cost is. We get a lot of speculation. We hear a lot of different things. When we check into things, we find out that, well, they, they didn't put this piece in their calculation or they didn't mention this piece. So we really uh, put a lot of extra effort and energy into getting down to an apples to apple and putting all the data in there and I think Robertson will do that for us in helping us see exactly what the costs are so that when we do the analysis we're not using speculative uh, speculative numbers as we uh, do but I guess again my question then if Robertson we come back and get that alternate and, and the board says hey we'd like to go forward does that then allow us to potentially go forward with the other projects well, or we are we going to do Robertson and then go back the old way with everybody no, else? No, I, I think um, if it is the decision of the board and it looks like that, and that is the decision of the direction we'd want to go, then I would go back to the others to um, look at what we could do to make adjustments to um, before we actually put those other projects out on the street. Timing's an issue, and we would just work through those. Okay, thank you. Questions for Mr. Wendt? I, I would reiterate a little bit of what Mr. Hosmer said about at least the engineers looking at the alternatives um, and allowing us to make the decision. Are the life cycle costs there? May not be, they may be, but uh, uh, there are some significant savings, uh, at least operationally, depending on what the upfront costs are and the feasibility of it going in. But you can't you, you don't know until you ask and uh, <coughs> and see what the numbers are okay any other questions for mr one okay thank you mr. Thank you, mr. Point. <coughs> moving on treasurer's report how the hell do you get back to the screen is there an easy way thank you uh if you'll open up the uh pdf file that's Just associated with the uh Treasurer's report and turn to the second page. You'll see the financial statement for December 2010. Uh, this statement shows uh, the month of December revenues and expenditures disaggregated from the year to date. I don't know if I use that word properly, but after Dr. Goodman does his presentation, I always have this urge to say disaggregated. Uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the first line, property taxes, You'll recall last month I indicated to the board that we received uh, approximately $7 million uh, more in December <coughs> than we would, had received last December. Um, I cautioned the board that that was probably uh, pretty much a timing difference. And sure enough, uh, in the, uh, uh, the month of January, and, and I also want to say in January we received two, two property tax payments. We have received the first payment uh, so far for January. Um, and year to date, including the first payment 
uh, in January were at $75.5 million, and uh, to compare apples to apples to the prior year, um, the prior year was at $75.2 million, so we're actually about $268,000 over last year, um, and that's even uh, uh, better in, when you keep in mind that we budgeted a decrease of 429000 um, So the property tax numbers are uh, good at this point in time. Uh, once again, a caution, uh, we will receive a, a second significant payment uh, closer to the end of January. Last year, that payment was about $13 million. Then in February last year, we received about $2.7 million, to put it in perspective and we received less than a million dollars in, in the subsequent months. Um, on the sales tax, uh, for the month we were down $92,000 from the previous December's collections, but once again year to date we're up about $250,000, so um, sales tax is, is also uh, doing fine in comparison to budget. Um, on the uh, <coughs> transportation side the revenue for uh, the month was down 101,000 from the previous December uh, fiscal year to date we're down about 600,000 uh, but keep in mind uh, we were aware of the decrease in transportation um, and so we're currently on track uh, with our budget for that as well um, overall revenues uh, year to date last year we were at 24 percent of what we eventually collected and this year we're at 30 percent uh, which is a good comparison and it's always nice when the expenditures year to date uh, as a per percentage are lower this year than they were last year and and they are um, when December closed I went through and, and updated my revenue projection uh, when I presented to the board last I indicated that an early projection indicated that we would be about 560,000 better than budget on the revenue side. My revised number is now 750,000 better than budget, but once again, it's still early in the year. Uh, one final piece of information of which the board is probably aware is that the uh, state has released some additional funding for transportation, and we anticipate receiving about <coughs> an additional $125,000 uh, for the year on that. When do you think we get that? I don't know. You may General. not. Well, that's, that was my <coughs> question. It, it, do we get that, or is that just kind of hanging out there, and if he needs it, we'll they'll use no. it again somewhere else? Okay. What did he say? What did John Spread say? Out. Spread, Spread out. out. Spread out. Is it still available? Still may be. Yeah. <clears throat> Questions? When you say we're on track with our budget for re revenue, what you mean is that we're on track to re receive $1.1 million less than we did last year. Is that what you're saying? One point Talk about transportation oh, revenue. Oh, I'm sorry. The, transportation, you see a yes. Reduction, so yes. Sometimes you say on track, I mean, everything's hunky dory. <laughs> We're on track to, to be have less. We're on right. track to <laughs> lose one million. We're on target to have Friends less money. We don't. <laughs> Correct. Right. Our planning was accurate. Is basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for Ms. Chodas? Thank you. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to accept the treasurer's report. Second. Motion by Dr. Prater and a second by Ms. Callan that uh, the board approve the treasurer's report. Dr. Coleman? Aye. 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 On to routine action items. Um, if there's no changes in any of the, follow any of the action items we've got, um, board may approve those. I need one motion. So moved. Second. A okay, motion by Ms. Callan and second by Ms. Twitty. The board approve each of the routine action items as submitted. Uh, questions? Ms. Tosmer? I don't have any questions. <laughs> oh, aye. Or aye. Answer. aye. Or answers. Aye. <laughs> aye. 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 General consent items. Uh, we've all, we've discussed those. Uh, 
uh, at our last January 11th study session, and I would entertain a motion to accept general consent items. So moved. Second. Okay, motion by Mr. Renner, a second by Dr. Holman that the board approve each recommendation submitted by the administration and general consent items. Dr. Holman? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to okay. comments from the board, legislative report. <coughs> Anybody got any clear crystal balls? Yeah. yeah. I, I talked to Scott Myers this afternoon. Uh, he said the hot items right now are fair tax, open enrollment. It's back. It's back on the burner, yeah. And uh, but he said it's just. There's just a lot of organization going on right now, so that was uh, that's pretty much where he's at. He says everybody's really waiting for the state of the state, which is tomorrow night by the governor, and uh, so. But you can see, by the way, on computer or any way you want to get it, or not, or not. Any other legislative? I just think we need to be ahead. I think fair tax is going to get some traction, and and. Yep. We need to be ahead of the curve in terms of what impact <coughs> that's likely to have on, on public education in the state of Missouri. And I know that uh, MNEA has, has kind of tracked that as well. I hope MSBA has tracked that and, and can provide us accurate information that we can then disseminate to our constituents that, that those things that might look good on paper can have some devastating impacts on <coughs> public education. So um, uh, I think we need to be well aware of that as, as as a board. We just need facts. And I know MSBA is working on that. Right. And I, I start saying MSBA, I know hasn't taken I know a position MAS yet. Too. Partly because they don't have enough information, but if it has, which I anticipate that having a negative impact on education funding, they will take a stand, they will take a position. But yeah, we're waiting some, for some data. And what, are, what are we really talking about? So yeah, I, I yeah, it's gonna get some traction, I agree. There's this uh, salute on the 26th. That's at 4:30. So, mm -hmm. want to go? Okay. Future issues. Okay. How about other issues? I have other one. Okay. The um, this is a this is a great one for us. The Missouri School Boards Association would like us to affirm our commitment to nominate uh, Mr. Lee as the president-elect of the Missouri School Boards Association. And as Mr. Renner knows, it's a lot of work, but it's a good position for us to have one of our school board members uh, in a high-level position with the Missouri School Boards Association. We don't need a motion for this, but if we uh, all want to consent to it, we'll send the um, under my under my signature as vice president, we'll send it in today. We have a discussion on it. <laughs> okay, and I will allow a brief discussion on it. <laughs> and congratulations. <Please. laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, get that out of the way. Um, in your board docs are the financial and operational reports for December 2010. So, please, if you get an opportunity, take a look at those. Uh, plus deltas. Don't forget to fill out any plus deltas for the for the meeting tonight and park them over there on our board. We do need to go into executive session, so I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Callan, and second by Dr. Prater that the board, the board meet in the executive session following this meeting to discuss legal and personnel matters as provided in section 610021. Discussion? Dr. Coleman? Aye. 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 